Moving on from Ganymede now takes us to one of the most intriguing moons in the Jovian system, Europa, a place thought to be one of the best chances to find extraterrestrial life in our solar system. As you approach Europa, you'll quickly notice one of its most distinctive features. It might be a snowball in space, but it's definitely not a clean one. You won't help but notice those red lines crisscrossing the surface. These lines are actually cracks and ridges in the surface, indicative of weak points in the ice. And the color, well, that comes from minerals and salts brought up from below. And it gives Europa a unique appearance. Europa is your final exam for the Jovian moons. Now, allow me to explain that a little bit. You know all those problems that you had on Callisto and Ganymede? Well, they're sort of taken to an extreme on this moon. Europa is not a place known for its vertical relief. It doesn't have the elevated features, craters, or massifs that you may have found on the previous two worlds. It is the smoothest surface in our solar system. But don't get the wrong impression that it's smooth like, say, a piece of paper. Because that couldn't be further from the truth. A better comparison would be saying it's like the Badlands are smooth compared to the Rocky Mountains. Both are rugged. Just one has a closer average to zero elevation than the other. Europa is a world known for its chaos terrain, a jumbled mess of terrain types all mashed together. It is a landscape brought into being by several factors. Earlier I mentioned that Europa is sort of a snowball in space. Well, to be a little more accurate, it's probably better to call it a slush ball in space. Europa, of course, is a water world, albeit one that's frozen and has a layer of ice that surrounds it anywhere from six to ten miles thick, maybe thicker. We don't necessarily quite know that. But one thing that scientists have determined is that Europa and its surface is some of the youngest terrain that we know of. Because of the gravitational pull of Jupiter and its orbital resonance with Ganymede and Io, Europa is thought to have an active core. This manifests itself as erupting ice plumes punching through the ice and as noted before, the scattering of that reddish color across the moon. All this activity in turn helps the moon continually recycle its surface, which explains the lack of craters. That's not to say Europa lacks for character. Far from it. If you are able to touch down, Europa presents a bit of a challenge particularly when it comes to traversing it. You're going to want to rope up, because crossing Europa would be akin to crossing a massive, ever-shifting, world-encompassing glacier with some of the craziest crevasses and seracs you'd ever see. And on top of that, there's the hidden water lakes that might lie just beneath the surface. There's even some speculation that parts of the moon could have fields of penitence 50-foot-tall, sharp-edged blades of ice reaching for the sky. They would be a sight worth seeing, if incredibly dangerous. Traveling across treacherous terrain won't be our only challenge, though, because we still have to deal with our old friend, Radiation. Except now, though, it's reached fatal levels. Europa receives 540 rem a day, enough to instantly kill an unprotected human. But while the chaos terrain may be an ice climber's dream, we're here to find a high point. 
with the possibility of the surface ice in some sort of flux, this could be a world where the high point shifts. There are ice massifs that have been identified, some rising to 1,500 feet in height. While you may think that we find ourselves in a similar predicament as our previous two moons, this time I'm happy to report we have a pretty credible lead. Though, before we get into that, we're going to take a slight detour and visit a few craters. The first, which is named Puish. Puish Crater is the second largest impact crater on Europa, with a diameter of 28 miles. The largest on the moon is Talisine, but size is not why we are here. Puish is also thought to be one of the youngest features on the moon, and more importantly, it is a complex crater and has a central peak that rises up 1800 feet. Perfect for an ice climbing adventure. After we finish at the Puish Crater, we'll move on to our second, the crater Silex. But not because it has any real geological significance, though interestingly enough it is used as a geographical feature to determine Europa's longitude. But because it is the most distinct reference point in finding Europa's high point. From Silix, you will travel several hundred miles to the coordinates of 34.5 degrees north and 169.5 degrees west. There stands a conical shaped knob like landform with an estimated elevation of 7,000 feet. And once on top of that, you will be on the highest point currently identified on Europa. Because of this peak's isolation and prominence, it should give you a spectacular view of the icy Europan moonscape and its wild, unforgiving chaos terrain. As we depart Europa, we put the challenges of the Galilean ice moons behind us. So far, our journey through the Jovian system has been a bit of a mixed bag. But that is all about to change as we head towards our final destination. Io is truly a world of fire and ice. The third largest of Jupiter's moons. It's also the fourth largest moon in our solar system. And it is a strange place. A hellish, aggressive, angry ball of energy. Compared to its counterparts, Io really seems to be sort of the odd one out. That said, it's one of the most fascinating and exotic moons in our entire solar system. It's thought to be the oldest of the Galilean satellites, forming quickly a thousand years from leftover debris from Jupiter. From an astro-pointing standpoint, it's in a league of its own. All those moons we did before basically were warm up for this. But a warm-up like if you were getting ready for a chess game by playing checkers. While the three icy moons are relatively low in density and are suspected to have copious amounts of water, Io, on the other hand, is the densest of all our solar system's moons and the driest object yet discovered in our cosmic backyard. And while all that is pretty amazing, the thing you will notice first about it is it looks different than most any other moon in our solar system. Despite its age, it has one of the youngest surfaces, and it is colored in a sickly shade of yellow and red because Io has one other thing going for it. It is the most volcanically and tectonically active body 
in our cosmic neighborhood. This moon's most defining feature is its volcanoes. And while we have theorized that, say, maybe Venus's volcanoes may be active, we know for certain that Io's are. This was discovered in a dramatic fashion when Voyager 1 flew by, capturing a plume on the limb of the moon. Io's erupting nature make it one of the few places in our solar system with known volcanism. The moon has about 400 volcanoes scattered across its surface. But volcanoes on Io? They're not like the volcanoes we know here on Earth, or even ones that we've encountered on, say, like Mars. Io's volcanoes are not like the massive shield volcanoes of Mars, or even the stratovolcanoes found here on Earth. No, Io's volcanoes have character all their own. They are more like massive pits on the surface. One interesting characteristic is they don't have much in the way of elevation. At most, maybe reaching 6,000 feet. So how did Io become such a, let's call it, dynamic place? Well, it all has to do with its location, its orbit, and what it's made of. Io orbits Jupiter at a distance of around 262,000 miles, just a little bit further than our moon for Earth. The moon's orbit around Jupiter is not circular, but elliptical. Sometimes closer, sometimes further away. If Io were located further out, this might not be a problem, but it's right next door to a giant, and it orbits Jupiter quickly, every 42 hours, meaning these gravitational tugs are happening frequently, and they cause the world to flex, which in turn creates energy. Here on Earth, we have a great example of another celestial body exerting its gravitational influence on us. This, once again, the moon and this time the ocean's tides pulling them in and out. Now, Io has tides as well. But they're a lot more extreme. And they aren't liquid, they're solid. Due to the intense gravity from Jupiter, the Ionian surface literally is pulled 300 feet out and back every single day. This situation, of course, is compounded by several of its fellow moons, Europa and Ganymede. Io is locked in orbital resonance with both of them. Those occasional tugs from those moons only exacerbate the situation. Every two times Io races around Jupiter, it lines up with Europa, which gives it a little tug. Then, on top of that, every four times Io races around Jupiter, it lines up with Ganymede, which also pulls on it. This tug of war that is going on between Jupiter and the moons generates energy through friction, which means heat. So, you can already tell where this is going. The heat and energy keep building up and up, enough to melt solid rock into liquid. At the same time, the pressure is being dialed up. Eventually, it just gets too much, and then boom! Io quakes and eruptions galore. Volcanic and tectonic activity for everybody. The eruptions, though, lead to some interesting results, not only for Io, but also Jupiter. Despite all this energy and heat being produced, the surface of Io is a bit on the chilly side. The average temperature is 202 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. This variance in temperature helps give the Ionian surface its color through the sulfur dioxide snowfields, which can also tell you where recent eruptions were since the sulfur turns colors as it cools, going from darker to lighter. Io's volcanoes, of course, help provide its thin atmosphere as well. 
But in case things aren't weird enough, let's make them a little more weird. Io's atmosphere isn't what you would call the most stable. As the moon moves into Jupiter's shadow, the atmosphere collapses, literally snowing down on the surface every time. While we have established that Jupiter has a lot of influence on its moons and the solar system in general, its relationship with Io is unique. Io's volcanoes don't just affect the moon, but also its planet as well. As mentioned earlier, Jupiter's magnetosphere is colossal, but it's actually bigger than it should be. So why is that? Well, as also mentioned a little while ago, Io is a bundle of energy. And these two things are actually related. Io's proximity, its density, and composition make it ideally suited to be a generator of sorts. One that's capable of producing 400,000 volts and up to 3 million amperes of electric current. Io forms a natural circuit with its planet, and all this power pumps up Jupiter's magnetic field to more than twice the size it would normally be. The challenges with radiation faced by any exploration in the Jovian system have a lot to do with this dynamic, and this relationship also manifests itself in other ways. Io is also responsible for the creation of the plasma torus around Jupiter, a donut-shaped intense radiation band around the planet created by the ionizing of one ton of oxygen and sulfur dioxide atoms a day provided by, you guessed it, Io's volcanoes. This isn't the only light show Io helps fuel. As the Juno space probe orbits over Jupiter's poles, it's been able to identify the effects the Galilean moons have on the gas giant's aurorae. Io, due to its proximity, has the greatest effect. One of the reasons Jupiter has such spectacular aurorae at its poles is because Io is supplying the heavy metals through its eruptions. The planet's powerful magnetic field then draws these towards the poles, and voila, amazing light shows. Well, that's really sort of simplifying a complex relationship between Jupiter and Io. It's safe to say there's a lot going on, and it's going to impact pretty much any potential exploration or expedition to that moon. That said, on this Dantean world, is we're going to find the object of our quest, the highest point in the Jovian system. For prospective climbers of Io, you will face some extreme challenges. After Venus, Io may be the most hostile place in our solar system. But unlike Venus, you won't have to deal with the crushing atmosphere. But now, that we know Io's role with Jupiter's magnetic field, the radiation has skyrocketed to a whopping 3,600 rem a day, seven times the lethal dose for a human. There is also a fresh new challenge that we're going to face on this moon, and it's one that we really haven't mentioned or encountered before. And that's the fact that Io stinks. All that sulfur and sulfur dioxide means that this moon is quite possibly the worst smelling place for humans in our entire cosmic backyard. Landing on here will introduce you to another completely alien landscape dotted with mountains, volcanoes, and faults. Plus, there are the lakes of molten sulfur and flows of molten silicates hundreds of kilometers long, some of them hidden from sight. Io's volcanism 
is worldwide and is constantly flexing due to the solid tides, meaning Ioquakes will be ever present. Plus, there's the danger of fallout from the eruptions themselves. While the Ionian volcanoes aren't necessarily our main objective, you may wish to take in several Patera, particularly Pele and Loki. Pele was the volcano that first provided photographic evidence of Io's volcanic nature. Erupting volcanoes on Earth are amazing sights, but they would pale in comparison to witnessing an eruption on Io. These skyrocketing explosions blast lava and debris everywhere at a scorching 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. Without really any limiting factors such as atmospheric pressure or gravity, means the plume can literally reach for the stars, high enough to even be seen with telescopes from Earth. Take for example, Loki, the largest and most active volcano on the moon. It puts out more heat than all of Earth's volcanoes combined. Its eruptions can reach heights of over 300 miles. That would be like a volcano erupting on Earth, rising above the International Space Station. In a bit of geological irony, let's call it, Io's highest point isn't volcanic. In fact, most of its tall mountains are not volcanic, but tectonic in origin. And while here on Earth, volcanism and mountain building sort of go hand in hand, on Io it's a little bit different. We know there's a relationship, but we're not sure what it is yet. That said, there is an exception. If you travel to 30 degrees south and 240 degrees west, you will find a volcano that looks more familiar to you. A conical shaped mountain rising up to 8,000 feet in elevation. This may be Io's tallest volcano. This tectonic activity is another way Io manages its excessive energy buildup. Many of the Ionian mountains have in their vicinity volcanic patera. And that relationship is one of the key mysteries that has yet to be solved. Despite its inhospitable nature, Io is something of a climber's paradise with 135 mountains identified so far on the surface. These mountains have an average of 98 miles in length and an average height of over 20,000 feet. Mountains on this world aren't in the continent-spanning ranges you find on Earth, but more isolated affairs, large, lonely structures scattered across the moon. While Io's mountains look like a diverse lot, they do have one thing in common. You won't find any pristine peaks in this wilderness. The mountains on this moon appear to be prone to wasting, evident through slumping, landslides, and explosive sapping. For astro pointers, this is a clue to proceed with caution, as stability of the slopes themselves could be a deadly danger. Despite this, that won't take away from the sheer magnificence of these peaks. If Mars is the planet with the most mountains in the top 10 with four, then Io is its moon counterpart. Io has three peaks in the top 10 tallest mountains in our solar system. And let's be honest, if you're gonna make it all the way to Io, you're probably gonna wanna bag all three of these peaks. But before we really dive into that, we're going to take a slight detour because there's another mountain on this place that's worth checking out named Towhill Mons. (music) 
While Tohil Mons is not exceptionally tall compared to some of the higher Ionian moons, it still comes in at a respectable 18,000 feet, taller than any peak in the lower 48 states of the USA. The reason you'll want to check this peak out, though, is because it is rather unique in its makeup. Tohil Mons is one of the most geologically complex mountains in our solar system, with evidence that the current mountain evolved out of previous mountains in the area. This peak has a striking appearance as well, and would be a worthy addition for any climbing expedition. Now that we've finished Tohill Mons as our, let's call it appetizer, it's time to turn our attention to the main meal. And our first course is Evia Mons. Now this rugby ball shaped mountain it's about 150 miles in length, and it's found deep in the Southern Hemisphere. It also comes with a friend, because on the southwest corner is Creedna Patera, a 100 mile in diameter volcanic caldera. The mountain was formed by the tilting of a crustal block brought up by a thrust fault, though its current appearance resulted from a landslide that occurred after the tilt. Interestingly enough, Evia Mons has an analog here on Earth, at least in how it came about. Its formation is thought to be similar to the Black Hills in South Dakota. You may wish to start your climb in the northeast and gain the ridge crest and follow that to the summit. As you work your way along, you'll be able to take in the remains of the landslide on the north side of the mountain. It's one of the largest debris aprons in our solar system, covering an area of almost 10,000 square miles. Looking further out, you may spy in the distance, Hyemus Montes near the South Pole, it rising up almost 30,000 feet. As you make your way along the southwest ridge, eventually you will reach the summit and be at an estimated elevation of about 40,000 feet. This is the third tallest mountain on Io and the eighth tallest mountain in our entire solar system. And due to its proximity to Cridna Patera, it might be one of the better places to take in an Ionian eruption. Our next stop is just above the Io equator, where you'll take in an interesting double ridged land feature. This is Ionian Mons. Both ridges are impressive. The western ridge rises up to an elevation of over 29,855 feet, taller than Mount Everest. The taller eastern ridge, though, tops out at 41,666 feet. Whether you choose to climb both ridges, well, that'll be up to you. But once you make your way up the eastern ridge of Ionian Mons, you'll find yourself on top of the second tallest mountain in the Jovian system. Not only that, you can also cross off the sixth tallest mountain in our entire solar system. Finally, we'll head to the Busale Montes. It's among this trio of peaks where we will find the current highest point in the Jovian system. The peaks were first imaged when Voyager 1 captured the eruption of Pele, and at present, this is still one of the best images we have of these mountains. A raised plane connects the Busalis Montes to each other. But interestingly enough, each peak has its own distinct composition. Now completionists will probably want to climb all three. But to compare it to say like the Tharsis on Mars, this place doesn't quite have that same sort of prominence. 
the two northern peaks are significantly less in elevation. That said, they are interesting, and on Earth, these peaks would be noteworthy for their elevation. The East Busali Mons is a plateau rising almost 23,000 feet. North Busale has an even more striking appearance, being split in half. It rises up over 27,000 feet. If you opt to pass on the North and East Peaks, then it's time to turn your focus on the Southern Peak. You won't be able to miss it, rising high above its counterparts, standing twice as tall as them. The southern peak of this trio is truly a sight to behold. If you ever needed an example of the incredible energy and stress caused by Jupiter's gravity, this easily could be Exhibit A. Massive slabs of rock brought up to the surface from below. That said, despite its stature, it actually seems to have, at least from the north, a rather gentle approach. That isn't the case on its southern side. One of the most distinct features on this peak is the cliff on that southeastern side. It has a face of over nine miles. It came about as a landslide sheared off that side of the mountain, and you can still see the debris piled up miles below. Once you reach the summit of South Busale Mons, you'll find yourself at an elevation of 59,800 feet, the highest point in the Jovian system. Not only that, you'll be standing atop the highest non-volcanic, tectonically created mountain and the fourth tallest overall in our entire solar system. The views up here should be spectacular, allowing you to take in the full breadth of the wild Ionian landscape. To the north, you'll spot your sister Busale Montes standing on the highland plain, and to the southeast, the volcano Pele, waiting to erupt once again. Our adventures in the Jovian system have started to reveal a few of the challenges we'll face as we head further out. But never fear, perhaps the most exciting thing about the mountains on Jupiter's moons is that, hopefully, we will soon have more definitive information about them. There are several missions lined up that will launch in the near future. And upon their arrival, we should soon know more about these amazing worlds. With our work done here at the Court of the King, it's time to take stock of some of our accomplishments. In addition to all our high-pointing adventures on the planet so far, we've also reached the top of seven of the ten tallest peaks and visited five of the ten largest moons in our solar system. But now let's turn our attention to the Court of the Queen of the Gas Giants, the ring beauty that is Saturn. I'm Scott Mara Thaler. Thanks for joining me. Before you go, click that red subscribe button below, and I'll see you soon.